right, let's get started. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is TJ Blakeman. I am the president of the Champaign County History Museum, and I want to welcome you all to our 2022 annual meeting. Um, it's great to have you all here. And like I said, we should have a good crowd today. And just as a reminder, we're recording this, uh, so it will be available to watch. If you want to share it with friends, we would certainly appreciate that just to help us spread the word and help uh, let others know of all the good work we're doing in the building. So the plan for tonight is pretty straightforward. I'm going to give about a 30 minute uh, discussion about some of the accomplishments we've had over the past year. And then at about the 30 minute mark, hopefully, uh, we do have a bit of business where we need to elect um, our board members. And so we'll do that kind of right in the middle before I step off. And then um, we're going to welcome to the stage Mary Butso, who has been the chair of our newspaper digitization um, effort out in St. Joe, and she is going to give us a great talk about uh, World War II uh, through the newspaper, through the eye of, of the St. Joseph record. And so without further ado, let me start the presentation here. There we go. Well, first of all, just as a reminder um, of our mission, our, you know, the Champaign County History Museum, our mission is to discover, collect, preserve, exhibit, study, and interpret objects, in particular three-dimensional objects related to the history of Champaign County, and to provide educational programs about the county's heritage and the museum's collection. And so everything we do, everything you'll hear on of all of our accomplishments, it all relates back to achieving this mission. And we couldn't do that without an incredible board. Um, I ask a ton of our board members. They're all outstanding. They all give of their own time. We are a completely volunteer organization um, in our leadership. And so I just wanna say thank you to everybody, to all of our board members. And I know several of you are on this on the call today and I know some of uh, our board members couldn't make it, but every year I want to reiterate how proud I am of the work that each and every one of them does and for all of the hard work and time that they give to the museum. I also want to introduce, I say new museum manager, it doesn't feel new uh, because he's been in the position since February, but last February we were proud to welcome Connor Monson to our museum family. Um, an outstanding individual, comes with a ton of history, passion, um, a university graduate, um, local. So, you know, we love it that he has that depth of knowledge already. And he's been doing an absolutely fantastic job with coordinating all of the activities within the building and um, monitoring and overseeing our intern program and our volunteers. So a big thanks to Connor for an outstanding year. And I hope you'll all stop by and introduce yourself in person. This year was a ex exceptional year for us, a very special year because it was our 50th anniversary of the founding of the museum. And so we've had a lot of fun with that this year. Um, we held an, uh, our anniversary event on the actual week of the founding back in May. And you see our birthday cake. We did tours. We had the popcorn wagon out. We did tours in the museum, walking tours of downtown, and even brought back our lemonade shakeups, which we haven't had uh, for a more than seven years um, at the museum. It used to be a fixture at the Taste of CU. Of course, the museum started the Taste of CU back in the day, and we were well known for our lemon shakeups. And so this year we brought them back. Uh, and you see that's that's. Uh, my daughter, uh, they're cutting up some lemons. So we had a ton of fun with that. And it's been great to um, relearn some of the history. You know, one of our volunteer projects was actually going through and sorting all of our organizational records. I think there were 12 boxes or more of organizational minutes and, and all of that history. And so they put that all into a much better organized system. There were tons of photographs and documents. Um, it, it's really been remarkable to look back. And we actually also created a list of all of the board members that have ever served. I think it's about 120 board members along with their terms. 
So if you go to our website under our history blog, we posted two stories back in May. One of them was kind of a history of the museum and the other was um, that list of board members to recognize them. So that's a really fun way to go back and look and remember some of the people who have helped build and sustain the museum over the past 50 years. The other big thing in this year was that we were named Small Museum of the Year by the Illinois Association of Museums. Uh, who, who would have thought that the anniversary could be overshadowed, but this was a huge accomplishment for the museum. And it's a real testament to all of the volunteer and, and the hard work and labor that's gone in to turning the museum around over the past seven years. And the nomination was just that, the, the whole story, the big picture about taking the museum from where it was to where we are today. And so we are incredibly proud. We're, we're thankful for the recognition by the Illinois Association of Museums. And not only did they give us Small Museum of the Year, but we also won three um, awards of excellence, one for our exhibit on the Illinois Traction System, one for our conservation effort in revitalizing our research room and re-indexing and reorganizing and putting our collection online. And the third was for community partnership, which was our Virginia Theater 100th anniversary event that um, our Vice President Perry Morris and myself were able to sit on the stage of the Virginia and give an hour long, um, real fun look back at the history of the Virginia. And that's actually, you can watch that entire presentation on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page. So um, great to be recognized. It's always good to be recognized, but especially by an organization like the Illinois Association of Museums, because those are other peer organizations that look at us and, and, and recognize the hard work that we're accomplishing. So some of the other accomplishments this year, of course, I mentioned we hired a museum manager um, who reported that this has been our best year for overall guest interactions. We count those, whether we, if we go out to take the popcorn wagon out, anytime we get a chance to interact with, with the public, we try to capture that because that's all part of our mission and growing our brand and our reach. And so the best year overall for guest interactions and number four for in-person visits to the museum. And so um, two big accomplishments in terms of our outreach. Uh, early in the year, back in January, we received a $15,000 grant from Champaign uh, Rotary for repairs to the roof. We are still working on those repairs. You'll see that in, in our goals for 2023. There's reasons we're still waiting on some state grant dollars um, that have been promised and a little difficult to get our hands. So um, that's moved to a 2023 accomplishment. I wanna throw a big thanks to our neighbor here at the Cattle Bank, Mike Hozier. Um, Mike has been a terrific supporter of the museum from day one. Um, and his buildings next door needed some parking lot work. And he was nice enough to also include a repaving of our parking lot and a rebuilding of our back sidewalk. And he didn't charge us a penny for it. And so a, a huge thanks goes out to Mike for such a kind gift to the museum. We also owned, we loaned a number of medical items from our collection to the Museum of the Grand Prairie for a fascinating exhibit they have on um, local health and contagions. Um, most of our items were um, a nurse's cape from Burnham Hospital and, um, and uh, well, I'll show you one of the other objects here on the, on the next couple of slides. Um, but some of our other medical instruments uh, from our Burnham Hospital collection and other pieces. We were excited. We kind of started a process through Facebook. We now can do fundraising campaigns directly through Facebook and they don't charge us for an administrative fee. So we're really excited to try this out. And we, we started with a, a plea for donations to help us further restore the popcorn wagon. And turns out we raised over $5,000 towards that effort. And I'll show you a little bit later what we plan on doing with that. We also initiated the new Champaign County newspaper digi digitization project, which is what our featured speaker is going to be talking about today. So I won't dwell on that. Um, and we launched a new locals campaign with our media partners at WW, WDWS and WHMS. Now, you hopefully will start to hear these on the radio. They're wonderful little minute, minute and a half long segments. Tamara McDaniels is our partner. She's the voice. And she delves in with our help 
into stories of locals that perhaps you've never heard about and tells their story in a really fun little way. And so um, you will start to hear more of those if you are listeners to the News Gazette media platforms um, and across all of their radio platforms. Very excited about that. We have a new Art in the Museum exhibit uh, that is highlighting local artists from around Champaign County that actually just started this week. And tomorrow um, we have our first opening reception. So every month, we will be changing uh, every month for the next five months. We will be changing that exhibit over and featuring a new local artist or some other art that was made in Champaign. This is really an effort to try to draw new people to the museum, especially during our slower winter months. And lastly, um, you see behind me, we created a new uh, video studio here in the museum that we're going to start using to create more online visual content where we can take some of our items in the collection and go a little more in depth or have some of our interns or volunteers come and tell stories that they've learned. So we're looking forward to using this little studio in lots of creative ways. So we had a couple of other recognitions between besides Small Museum of the Year. I wanna thank the Daughters of the American Revolution for um, recognizing the hard work at the museum. And if you were at the parade, the 4th of July parade, we won first prize in the antique vehicle category. And so we have a new trophy in the building. Here's just a quick look. The first, uh, that art in the museum exhibit that's starting this week. Uh, the first up is, a, is an exhibit featuring uh, the late Harry Breen, who passed away just recently. And his family has brought a number of his pieces to have another kind of, or, a retrospective of, of his complete works. And so um, Ian Wang, one of our board members has been curating this exhibit and all of these art in the museum exhibits. And so we're very much looking forward to, uh, to that. So hopefully if you wanna come out tomorrow, our kind of opening night every month to, to kick it off, we will have a reception where we'll have some food and drink where you can come in and get a, a, a look at the items with um, either the artist here or, or some of the family from uh, of the artist. So highlights from the collection, um, I mentioned the items we were donated that we loaned to the Museum of Grand Prairie. And that also is perhaps one of the biggest and most interesting objects that was donated to the collection this year. And that is the very first iron lung from Burnham City Hospital. And um, Kevin Martindale uh, lives in Urbana. His wife um, used this iron lung all the way until 2020, until 2002, I believe. Um, I could be off on that date, I'm sorry. Um, but it had been in his garage and he had been keeping it alive for her, for her to use and of course no longer needed it. And it has a wonderful plaque. It was um, donated to the museum by the Champaign-Urbana Liquor Dealers Association and there's a plaque on the side of it. And it has a really fascinating story that, that really drives right to the heart of the story of one of our past uh, local epidemics, uh, national epidemics with polio, but terrific story. We were able to take that item directly and, and send it to Museum of the Grand Prairie where they made it the, the hallmark and centerpiece for their new exhibit. And so we were excited to be able to, to find that item and make it a permanent uh, fixture in our collection. Just a couple of the others. I mean, we've been getting some amazing items. I don't have time to go through each of them, but I brought, I, I'm highlighting just three of them here. One of them is brand new within the past month. Uh, that are the, those are the medals that you see um, there. I, I, I put this here. Number one, this was um, a Vietnam veteran or Vietnam soldier from Champaign who died in Vietnam, but his family, was able to donate his medals. And I highlight this because we don't have much from the Vietnam War era. And so we're very blessed to have uh, these pieces and to be able to tell his story. And so we'll, we'll pull that full story together uh, in a posting on our website so, we can, so you can learn all about that. And then lastly, these were the arrowheads were sent to us from the state of Virginia. I, 
I could be wrong on that. I'm sorry. I get, we get so many items, I forget where they came. I'm pretty sure it came from the state of Virginia, but they were originally from a farm um, down near Tolono. And we actually sent these, number one, we don't have many items relating to pre-European settlement here in Champaign County. So we were excited to add them to the collection, but we sent them to the, um, to the university to tell us a little bit more about them. And what's fascinating about these is that one of them in particular dates to almost 10,000 years, uh, 8,000 BCE. And so the age on these is particularly notable. And so we're very excited to have it. It certainly becomes the oldest piece uh, in our collection, but we're excited to have these pieces that help tell the more the fuller story of Champaign County and our entire region. We also processed over 1,500 items that you can now find even more growing by the month on our online collection. And I encourage you all to go and peruse that. You can see photographs and learn more about our collection. And like I said, it grows all the time. And we have interns that go in and correct records where um, either they're not complete. So we have to go back to the paper files or there's other typographical issues. And so we've been going through and also cleaning up uh, our computer records as well. We have brought back our History Talk series, which has been terrific to get back to. It's great to see folks in person. We do sometimes alternate them between online and in-person. And sometimes now, because of size, we've been holding some of them at the Champaign Public Library to give ourselves some more space. So here you see a talk about the Lincoln uh, Circuit Rider Monuments. We held this talk at the Champaign Public Library. They've been terrific hosts. Uh, for us. And sometimes we have them in our um, in our boardroom, and sometimes we have them online. So be sure when you're signing up for the story that you make sure and, and know exactly where it's going to take place. But we have three really fascinating topics coming up. Um, Dangerous Ideas on Campus looks at the 1960s and some of the issues uh, that were going on on the University of Campus based on a new book. Um, the History of the Wilbur Mansion, Our Old Home, Madison Story, uh, does a lot of architectural history work, and so she's been diving into the architecture and the history of the old Wilbur Mansion. And then Alexander Bowman, who's the Bowman map, is a map that we have hanging on our walls, and you've seen that around, I'm sure. It's the earliest map of West Urbana and Urbana, uh, and it shows every little structure that was built. And so Ryan's going to go in a little more in depth and talk about the history of the Bowman map. So you can find all of those and sign up for them on our website. And now we've been doing a better job of getting future talks on the website so you can go directly to the talk that you want to attend and register uh, instead of having to wait until we post it the month before. I mentioned our new media studio, which you see behind me, but that also means we've been trying to professionalize our online video content. And so we've taken a lot of our old history talk uh, seminars and we've remastered them and put them uh, on our YouTube channel as, along with our other annual meetings. So if you wanna go back and see what we were up to a couple of years ago, and we hope to be adding to this a lot more regularly. And I would encourage you, if you are on YouTube, please go and subscribe to our channel because you can see here at the time I pulled the screenshot, we had only 44 subscribers, but we need to get to 50 because that's the minimum that YouTube requires for us to be able to stream talks directly to their platform. So we need you to go sign up. I want a lot more than 40 subscribers and we'll get there, um, but we'll get there by being able to put more of our content online. I mentioned the restoration of the popcorn wagon. We're very excited about this. Um, we have been trying to do our best to add and, and of course maintain the popcorn wagon, but now we're ready to take it a little bit further. And over the years, as the popcorn wagon has gone through different restorations, full restorations, repairs, some of the decorative features on the popcorn wagon have disappeared. Um, that includes some of the brass fixtures, um, uh, and the actual steam motor itself was abandoned when the steam motor, of course, that's very difficult for volunteers to run a steam powered popper. 
but the motor itself is no longer with us. And we have leads, we might know where it's at, but, um, but we want something that can demonstrate to people what the popcorn wagon looked like it when Henry and Lucille Sansone had it on the street. So everything from the corner castings, you see those kind of bright copper or uh, brass corner castings to the little C brackets at the top. Um, we're having all of that remanufactured by a restoration specialist named Bob Pearson in Olathe, Kansas. And what's so special about Bob is that he works directly with the Creators Company in Chicago who built the wagon. And in fact, he had this picture on the left. This is the first picture of our wagon as it rolled off the assembly line in July of 1920. So he was able to actually, it was part of a, we, we've also learned a lot about the history of the popcorn wagon. We've, it's been said before that it was horse drawn. That's not true. It actually came off as a custom built early model Model T chassis before they actually started mass producing them. So it was a part of a very short um, run of special popcorn wagons. And now we have the picture. Um, but Bob has all of the original castings and the tool and dies from Creators. And so he is Creators specialist and rebuilds wagons for them. And so in his shop, he is rebuilding parts for our wagon from the original masters. And so we will have um, many of those decorative elements as well as a replica of the steam uh, motor, which will be run by a little electric motor now, but it'll help to add to the story and show people a little closer to how the popcorn wagon used to look. Also, we're excited that we, have for the first time in a very long time, we've bought a brand new popper electric kettle from Creators, from the company that built the wagon. Um, and so we will be installing, hopefully, all of these parts this winter uh, while the wagon is, is in its downtime. So we're very excited about that. And then the Champaign County Newspaper Digitization Initiative, CINDY, uh, as, for the acronym. This is an exciting new project for us. We use newspapers, we use newspapers so much in what we do with our exhibit development to our research on objects. But yet a lot of the small town newspapers in Champaign County have never been digitized. Even the News Gazette has never been digitized and made publicly available. We're fortunate enough to have the Courier and the Daily Illini, some of the old Champaign News and Champaign Gazettes, but we don't have a lot of small town papers. And so as a kickstart for this initiative, the first newspaper is the St. Joseph Record, um, and Mary's going to tell us a little bit more about this as she does her talk. But our goal is to raise $30,000 to digitize this newspaper. And for every dollar we raise, it equals a page that's digitized. And so we've made it easy to give. You can go right to our website. You can give any amount. You can write a check and send it in. Just make sure you note on the memo line that it's for the newspaper project. Um, but we are breaking this out into $10,000 chunks. Right, there's $16,000 chunks um, so that we can send chunks of it uh, to be digitized even without having the full amount. And so every little bit helps. We would love for you to help us spread the word. This is a really valuable uh, resource, especially for those small towns, but also for us as we do more research and really include all of Champaign County in our efforts. So I'm just about to wrap up here. Our goals for 2023. We are finally going to complete the needed repairs to the cattle bank. Those repairs have grown besides just the roof, the cornice of the building, the windows, some of the windows, um, some of the repair work inside, some of the plumbing work. So we do have our work cut out for us. We've been fortunate enough to uh, continue to have financial support from our members and donors to help us undertake those. But once we get the state grant finally squared away, um, we are looking forward to using that rotary money, using the state of Illinois money and using some of our donors support to get those, that work done. We do plan to open um, three new galleries within the calendar year. Uh, one of them will be after our art in the museum exhibit is done. And um, one will replace our photography exhibit. The last one could 
hopefully by the end of 2023 will be to replace our Illinois Traction exhibit. We certainly want to grow our membership. Um, we need members. They are the lifeblood of our organization. We would love your help in, in reaching out to your friends and family and telling them what you've learned on this talk today and say all of the great work that's going on, you should support them too. You know, I support them and you should support them. Our membership start as little as $35. And so we would love it if you would help us grow our membership. We want to continue to grow our intern and volunteer program, which has really been strengthened over the past year, year and a half. Uh, the University of Illinois, we have built a really strong relationship with them. We're getting some terrific interns. They are the ones producing their, our, some of our story content. They're the ones going in and helping us um, digitize the collection and reorganize our library. Uh, terrific students from the history department, the library and information science department. Um, so I can't say enough about that partnership and want to continue to grow it. We want to continue to put things online so that you can access them. We hate that our collection, that our 20,000 plus object collection is locked away um, out of the sight of the public. And we have such limited space here at the Cattle Bank. We want you to see those objects. So every month we're digitizing more items and putting them online for you to be able to explore. And lastly, we want to build our visual presence with our new studio. We know that um, Different types of media attract different audiences. And certainly we wanna be in a lot of those spaces. And so we're anxious to get uh, to using our little studio here to do that. And finally, we are embarking in a much more serious way on building a strategy for a possible new history center. We know that in the past year, we, the, the county has lost its children's museum. And as we've done our exploration, as we've looked around at other communities, we know that Champaign County lacks many of the cultural centers uh, that, that our peer cities have. And so we feel that as an organization, we can help to solve that. As I mentioned, we continue, to, we struggle to fulfill our mission here in the Cattle Bank. We love our home, which has become one of our most important artifacts, but it also comes with challenges. Our galleries are very small. We can't welcome uh, Unit 4, Unit 116, Rantoul, Muhammad elementary students to our building. We can't hold that many children at one time. Um, we have a hard time sustaining a growth in our employees, in our employment, when we can't drive the kind of traffic through our door that will help support those kinds of salaries. And so in our 50th year, it's incumbent on us as a board to really think about what we need to do to ensure that this museum lasts for the next 50 years and beyond. So I say we must think boldly and that's true. And, and we are planning to do that. We have had We've had some really good conversations with a lot of community leaders. We have developed some very interesting ideas and I don't mean to be coy about them. We're just not ready to publicly discuss them just yet. But I'm hoping that within the next few months, we'll be in a position to reconvene um, our membership and perhaps have a, a broader conversation about where we think we might go. Um, so I say that, and if anyone uh, has an interest in joining that conversation at the outset, why certainly feel free to email me um, and, uh, and feel free to give me your thoughts about that. But um, we can always use your help. I mentioned it before, um, our membership is, is the lifeblood of the museum, but Beyond that, we could use your volunteer support, your donations, um, your help in spreading the word about our museum. All of those are things that will help us preserve and protect uh, our local history for generations to come. So if you're on this call and you're not a member, I hope you will consider becoming a member. We, for as little as a a dinner out once a year, you can become a member 
of the museum. And I want to say thank you to all of the members out there who have not only continued to renew their membership, but increased their membership year over year. That is incredibly helpful to us. You can also follow us on all of our social media channels. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Our website has a ton of new content from stories to videos, as I've mentioned. So please connect with us, um, share stories. We love to hear when people comment on our photos or our artifact posts online, telling us a little bit more of the deeper history of those. Of those. <clears throat> and lastly, I just wanted to throw up, you know, we, we are so excited when, we, when people visit us and they leave a comment. And on Google, when I was looking the other day, we have a 4.9 stars, which is great. Um, people leave such wonderful stories. Um, they have such nice things to say, cool little museum, great historical museum, volunteer, volunteers and staff are very knowledgeable. I, these make our day. And so if you have the option, opportunity to leave us uh, a comment, that only helps when visitors come to our community and are looking for something to do, gives them the assurance that this is a place that they wanna go visit. All right, so that's the end of my uh, state of the museum, but we do have a little bit of business to take care of, and that is to elect a slate of candidates to the board of trustees. We have four members, uh, who are part of the slate that we're recommending. Um, we actually do have two additional vacancies that are open and we can take nominations from the floor from existing members. Um, so I'm gonna real quickly, I'll stop the share just to ask if there are any, if there are any nominations from the floor by members of the museum. Okay, hearing none, um, I've tried to make this a little easy by creating a poll. Let's see here. Um, I'm gonna launch a poll and I, and I would ask that if you're only members, the museum should be voting, um, but you should be able to vote using this poll. So I'll throw that up there now. <laughs> and I would ask that you go in and um, vote yes by clicking the check or no by not clicking the check and we'll have a majority of those in attendance um to determine if that is an affirmative and i got two people in the i got some people in the in the room with me today they're voting in the affirmative so i appreciate that all right that sounds good of all I, it's like the the legislature have all voted who wish have all voted who wish have all voted who wish okay take the record um terrific well i appreciate that it looks like we've got a hundred percent um uh hundred percent in the affirmative and so i do appreciate um your vote so um with that actually i think the only thing i had left was um, whether or not there are questions. So I should stop my share. So are there any questions for anything that, um, that I said? I'd be happy to answer. I'm running a little over, Mary. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. I don't mean to, we're not gonna pressure you, I promise. Uh, I get long-winded if you know me. Uh, any questions? Okay, I'm gonna turn things over to Mary. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, TJ. Um, I should introduce myself. My name is Mary Butso. Uh, I'm a retired nurse. And for the last 18 months, my husband Charlie and I have been volunteering at here at the History Museum. And in um, this fall, TJ asked me to spearhead a, a, a new project that is the Champaign County Digital Newspaper Initiative. Uh, the goal of this project is uh, pretty simple. It's to convert into a usable digital format local community newspapers that were published in Champaign County. And it's fairly straightforward. Uh, over the last 50 to 100 years, there have been multiple newspapers in small towns and small communities that didn't tell national news, didn't tell state news. It told the local history, the local news of the community. And there is always a potential of losing these stories 
without them being shared. Uh, this is a cooperative effort. There it goes. It's a cooperative effort between the Champaign County History Museum, the Champaign County Archives at the Urbana Free Library, the Illinois Digital Newspaper Collection at the University of Illinois, the University of Illinois History, Philosophy and Newspaper Library, and the local communities uh, from which the papers came. Um, the current state of the collections, some of them are on microfilm, which is fairly stable, but difficult to access. And if you've never been to the um, archives at the, at the Urbana Library looking through the microfilm, you end up in a very dark space with the microfilm on a fairly touchy machine going page by page very slowly. Uh, your other alternative is paper copies, which are very unstable and fragile. And this makes difficult um, research very difficult, particularly those of us who are now in 2022 used to search engines. We're used to going on the computer and putting in a date and a name and a topic and poof, there's all your information. Rather than uh, having to know what year you want, pretty much what date you want, and pretty much having to know what, you, what you're looking for. Otherwise, you just get some happy surprises on occasion. So what we propose is a process to convert this into a, uh, this material into a digital format, mostly from the microfilm, using a process called segmentation. And in segmentation, what the digital group does is they uh, take a newspaper article and they take out the, uh, the name, the date, the topic, and put it into a, a search engine type format. So when it's put back together again and available online, you can use the search engine of the Illinois Digital Newspaper Collection to um, search as you would something, for example, on Google. Um, that would then be posted on the Illinois Digital Newspaper uh, Collection, which is at the University of Illinois. And once it's posted on there, um, users have no, there's no cost to the user for access. There's no subscription fee. It's open to the public for anything they want to um, use off of it. Now we chose to start with Dale Publications, which is a St. Joe record for a variety of reasons. Dale, I refer to it as Dale Publications because the St. Joseph Record, which is the paper I grew up with, um, was also published in several other communities with a different title. So it covered a huge swath of Eastern Champaign County and Western Vermilion County because the St. Joseph Record was also published at the same time as the Ogden Courier, the um, Homer Enterprise, the Fairmount Star, and the Ogden uh, Oakwood Township News. It covered news um, from the communities of not only St. Joseph, Ogden, Homer, um, but also Fithian, Royal, Flatville, some little bitty places that um, uh, don't get a lot of, of recording. Um, it's available, it was published from 1894 to 1980, that's 86 years. And all of this is available on microfilm. Um, then the microfilm has been judged, judged to be in good shape which means that you can read it. It's, it's very readable. And, they, and the uh, company that's going to do the digitization said that it's, it's very usable. And it's a fairly homogeneous paper. It only had four owner publishers over the 86 years. And the last owner publishers I knew quite well, it, the people in the picture here, that's uh, Bob and Barbara Butler, who were the editors of the paper from 1952 to 1980. And their children, particularly their oldest daughter, Jean, um, has been very, very supportive of us in this process. Uh, Jean and I have been friends since before we started first grade. And so we're very, very good friends. And this is my hometown. So I have a vested interest in seeing that this happens. Now, Jean always wants me to tell people what's the value of the Champaign County Newspaper Digitization Initiative. And basically we came up with a theme of empowering communities to tell their stories. And um, what kind of stories are they going to tell? Well, uh, they tell community stories. In the paper, there are um, village board minutes. There are um, the meetings of the school board, church meetings. Um, and what crime was reported, there was crime reported in, in the paper. Uh, social activities, Lions Club, American Legion, um, the Masons, um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Women's Club, 
And I want to say something special about 4-H clubs. Um, those of us who grew up in 4-H, the first meeting of the year, they elected officers and the youngest kid in the club was made the reporter because they didn't know what else to do with you. So the reporter's job was to write down at, for every meeting where the meeting was held and um, who, who did the demonstration and who did the talk and what we talked about and with, that we had refreshments and who was there. Uh, and then you took, sent it to the paper. You sent it to the St. Joe Record because the News Gazette and the Courier didn't want any part of that. So I found out much later in life that Mrs. Butler would very discreetly correct your grammar and your spelling and published it under your byline. So it came out that I belonged to the Blue Mountain 4-H Club and at the bottom it would say Mary Waters reporter. So you did have your own byline uh, for at least six to nine months when you were 10 years old. Um, they also covered achievements, uh, scholarships, awards, and sports achievements. Not only did they cover the high school football and basketball for all the communities involved, including ABL, which was Alex and Broadlands and Longview for those of us who've been around for a while, but they also did the grade school basketball. Um, Muncie, which is a practically non-existent community now, there's never, very few people there, but Muncie used to have a really tough basketball team in grade school, and they are um, featured in the paper a lot. Also, um, Bob Butler was really big on Little League, and so in the 60s and 70s, he published everybody's Little League stats, which are the, um, 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 a friend of mine said it's, it's, um, um, what you want to brag on your to your uh, grandkids about. And, and oh, and they also covered the, there was a bowling alley that opened in the early 60s and they published the bowling scores. So if you want to check on your parents' bowling scores, you can. Uh, also, for those of us who are into families and genealogical research, um, births, weddings, um, deaths, family reunions listing the people who attended and birthday parties listing the people who attended were all covered in the St. Joe record. So if you will bear with me, I thought we'd spend a few minutes tonight uh, with me sharing with you what types of histories you can find in a paper like the St. Joe record. And because it's, it's December 7th and 81 years ago uh, was Pearl Harbor Day, um, I thought we would look at an intimate picture of World War II. Now it's an intimate picture because the stories I'm going to tell you um, have to do with people I knew. Some of them are family. Some of them are people I knew around St. Joe and Ogden growing up. Uh, some of them are the fathers of friends of mine or people I went to school with. And a lot of this very rich history is because of this gentleman. This is Charles W. Dale, who was the editor publisher of the St. Joseph Record and actually created uh, Dale Publications. Um, between 1929 and 1951. And I knew Mr. Dale as an ancient, ancient man around town. He lived to be 100. And, um, but during World War II, um, he made sure that any serviceman in the area for whom he could get an address was sent a copy of the St. Joe record every week. And these guys would write back to him. And so what I have is letters to the editor, essentially, that were sent from guys overseas. And I say guys because 99% of them were men. Very little is said about women in, in the service, in the, in the paper. Now, before December 7th, 1941, um, there's not a lot in the St. Joe record about the war. There was a war going on in Europe. There was war going on in China and in the Pacific, but not much is said in the St. Joe record until after um, Pearl Harbor Day. So what was being covered in the paper? Well, if you go back out of the front page into pages five, six, seven, back in the back of the paper, uh, you would find as early as June, 1940, uh, advertisement calling for people to volunteer for the Red Cross or to send money to the Red Cross. And this, an ad like this was in the paper just about every week. As I said, very little news about the war was there, but occasionally something would pop up. This was in March 7th, 1941 edition, and it has to do with the famine and the food shortages in Europe. And this would have been very interesting to the local farming community 
as to the fact that there was a famine as well as the war going on in Europe. So if they weren't covering the war, what were they talking about in the paper? Well, they were talking about small town regular things. And, and um, at home in St. Joe in 1941, my parents were seniors in high school, in the St. Joe High School. And they, the paper is full of actual small town things. Now, just a little disclaimer, I have three pictures here that actually appear in the St. Joe record, but the quality I got off the microfilm wasn't very good. So I cheated and I went back to the 1941 high school yearbook and took the same pictures out of there. And they're, they're much better. So anyway, here's the basketball team. They did very well that year. And number five in the front row is my dad. So that's my dad. And the guy in the t-shirt in the second row on the far right-hand side is the coach and he will come up later. Also, they had a newspaper and the Dale Publications published their newspaper as they did the school newspaper until they uh, went out of business in 1980. The school high school newspaper was always part of Dale Publications. And probably the most noteworthy thing that happened in the high school in 1941 was that the mixed chorus um, under the direction of Mrs. Blanche, of Miss Blanche Moy, uh, took first in the state and went to the regional competition in Flint, Michigan, uh, where they placed second. So Miss Moy is on the far left-hand side of the picture. My dad is six over in the back row, and my mother was the accompanist, and she's on the end. Now, some of you have met my Aunt Esther, who's done a couple of oral histories for the uh, museum this year. Uh, she's the fourth one over in the front, uh, fourth from the left in the front. So that's Aunt Esther. But at the same time these kids were enjoying high school, some of their friends were doing other things. Billy Cole left high school and joined the Navy. And this is from March 21st, 1941, nine months before Pearl Harbor, he'd already joined the Navy. And it says here that he was an electrician on the USS Saratoga, which was an airplane carrier, not an aircraft carrier, an airplane carrier is what it was said. Now there's a connection between Billy Cole and the traction um, uh, system exhibit downstairs because his father was the station master of the traction uh, depot in St. Joe. And they lived above the traction depot um, on Lincoln Street in St. Joe. And that same paper was a picture of Clarence Putnam from Royal who had also joined the military. He was in the army. And in the May 2nd, 1941 paper, it mentioned that the draft had started in anticipation of hostilities. And the first person drafted from the area was Warren C. Weaver, who was sent to uh, basic training in Texas. Now, once war was declared after December 7th, 1941, the tone of the paper changes a little bit. The next week, on December 12, 1941, there's an article about host a soldier for Christmas. Chanute Field was open and they were encouraging women in the town to bring home a soldier as a family member for Christmas. They also on December 19th, started a campaign called Remember the Boys, putting together gift boxes of baked goods, candies, toiletries and books to be sent to um, uh, people in the service, men in the service. And they, uh, the boxes got there because in the January 2nd, 1942 paper, the thank you notes were printed from the guys who got the boxes. December 26, 1941, Mr. Dale started printing a regular article called Boys in the Armed Forces. And he would list as a regular feature that um, the people who were, had been um, either drafted or enlisted and where they were and what they were doing. And some name, this is too small a print to read, but there are some names in here that I'm going to refer back to in uh, a few minutes, including Bill Cole again, a guy named Russell Marsh, Stanley Hall, who was the coach of the basketball team. He has now gone to um, Officers Candidate School and um, Chet Hanks and Robert Weaver. From 1942 to 1943, every week, there were eight to 10 feature articles in the newspaper regarding people who were in the service, either they had enlisted, where they were training, 
where they were leaving, when they were leaving home and where they were going. And most of them were moving around the US. Very few of them were, had been sent overseas yet. But starting the end of 1943, people were really moving out. And this is my dad in September 1943, right before he was shipped to the Pacific with his girlfriend Toots. Um, he was a Navy corpsman, and this is going to come up again later. Uh, in 1942, though, in November 1942, Mr. Dale got a warning from the War Department, so he had to adjust how he published the paper. It says, because of restrictions by our government in uh, regard to the publication of any information which might be of value to the enemy concerning the size and movement of troops or the number of men in service from any one community, he was going to discontinue publishing a list of names in Boys Away. However, he makes the point that he will still be sending the record weekly to anyone for whom he had an address. Now the guys in, in St. Joe and Ogden and Royal were beginning to see action. Uh, Staff Sergeant Chet Hanks, um, who was the dad of a friend of mine, got sent to India. And I never could figure out why he was in India, but apparently he was with the um, airplanes. He serviced the airplanes that flew over the Himalayas to go to Burma. So um, Chet Hanks wrote home and sent rupees because they, they look like funny money. So he sent some rupees home and he asked them to please send toothpaste. So that, that was what he wanted. Russell Marsh wrote in November 19th, 1943, he wrote his family a year ago today, I was on my way to North Africa. I didn't have any idea that now I would be in Italy. So he spent a year in North Africa, then he got sent to Italy. And for a 20 some year old man, um, this sounds a little bit like a, um, a travel log. Uh, they, they wrote very descriptively of where they were when they could. And I think it's really interesting that he says that, um, um, I like Italy a lot better than North Africa. It's nice and warm and everything is green and pretty. There's lots of flowers in bloom and there's also plenty of fruit. Apples are ripe and it will only be a few days until the oranges and dates will be ripe. This is a mountainous and hilly country and little towns dot the hillsides. The towns are really old and look like they've been here for years. Yeah, Russell, what do you think? <laughs> it's, it's Italy, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, he said they look like they've been there a long time. The buildings are made of stone and nearly all the houses have balconies. The cobblestone streets are narrow and winding and I get a kick out of the farmers working the fields with their big white oxen. So you do get a little bit of a travelogue from a 20 year old's perspective. Here's an example of someone writing home to Mr. Dale. This is from June 24th, 1944. Adolph Wilms writes, um, um, just received a couple of copies of the record and they're just as newsy as the first ones I got two years ago. So he had been in the Pacific for two years already and um, he kept getting the record, which he really appreciated. Life on this rock, he won't tell you where he's at. Life on this rock is busier than New Zealand. The people were really good to us there and surely enjoyed our short stay after not seeing any civilization for almost a year. So we're not quite sure where he was in the Pacific and now he's on a rock. I hear from home pretty often. If you have someone overseas, write them as often as they always like to hear from friends and relatives back home. Thanks a million for the other ever faithful paper. And then in February 16th, 1945, my dad wrote, um, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Dale, it's hard for me to start this letter because it's hard to find anything to talk about. The censor is rather tough on a person. So if I write too much of the wrong thing, you just get a piece of paper with a big hole in it. And some of his B letters are, Dear Mom and Dad, huge hole, <laughs> love Bob at the end, because he, he talked about the wrong things. First of all, I want to thank you for the record. It comes through in fine shape and sure does bring the old hometown closer to me. Of course, there've been some changes here and there and some of the names are different, but old friends of mine still come into the news. You'll never know what it means to read about the people who were your friends so long ago. Um, so long ago, he'd been overseas 18 months, but it, when you're 20 years old, it's so long ago. At this point, he was on a destroyer. Now, there are also in the paper what I call happy serendipity, odd things that happened, people who met up with other people. 
if you think about World War II, thousands and thousands of Americans were in the service and deployed thousands and thousands of miles from home, and they would end up running into each other. Now, St. Joe and Ogden and Royal are not very big towns. And in 1941, the total population was about 1,200 people. But somehow, they would find connections far from home. And this is one of the interesting ones. Uh, my dad's sister, Esther, that was in the picture of, of the chorus, um, when she got out of high school, became a nursing student at Burnham City Hospital. And this says, Miss Esther Waters, junior nurse at Burnham Hospital in Champaign, received a letter the other day, which brought to light some of the surprising circumstances brought about in a global war. The letter was from signalman David Smith, now with the Navy in the South Pacific, who a year ago had been in the Naval Training School at the University of Illinois. During his training period there, he was a patient at Burnham Hospital following an appendix operation and Miss Waters was one of his nurses. So I asked my aunt about this and she said, well, if one of the guys who were in the training schools had to be in the hospital, they kept them in the hospital until they were well enough to stay in the barracks by themselves. So sometimes they stayed as long as two weeks in the hospital. Well, you have a young guy in the hospital with all these student nurses, they're going to kind of congregate around him. And uh, I also know that after he was discharged, he took her out a few times. So they were, they were kind of chummy. Anyway, Sigmund Smith wrote her that he, she would never guess where he was and who he had just met. Um, he was in the hospital in a South Pacific area suffering from a blood infection. And the man who was caring for him in the hospital was Robert Waters, her brother. Um, upon hearing the water's name, the sick sailor told him that he'd been cared for a year ago by a nurse at Burnham Hospital in Champaign, Illinois, by the name of Esther Waters, um, to which I'm sure my dad rolled his eyes and said, yeah, that's my sister. So it's one of those really odd things that happen. Another serendipity that happened, this Russell Marsh, the guy who wrote from um, Italy, in 1945 was coming home from Italy back to Miami Beach, Florida for reassignment. And on the ship on the way over, he met Omar Lambden who grew up in St. Joe. And so they ended up in Florida as roommates because they met on the ship coming home. And then in July 20th, 1945, in the paper it mentioned that um, a letter written July 7th from Lyon, France, um, was from Captain Kent Dale, who is Mr. Dale's son, uh, who is a chaplain uh, with the Seventh Army. And they had, oh, they had taken over a hotel in Lyon, France for recuperating um, soldiers who had been injured. And in the lobby one day, he runs into a guy named Orville Maddock who had been wounded. Well, Kent Dale was about five years older than Orville Maddock. So when Orville Maddock went up to him and said, are you from St. Joe? Captain Dale didn't know who he was, but then once he introduced himself, he realized, oh yeah, you were that kid when I was growing up. So although they were five years difference in age, uh, Sergeant Maddock um, and Captain Dale said, um, they went to Captain Dale's room and according to the chaplain's letter had a bull session until noon. So they, they talked for quite a while. So again, far from home in France and you run into somebody you know. Um, about this time in 1944, you start seeing a lot of action. And this is from William Anderson, July 28, 1944. This is about five weeks post D-Day. Um, the letter was written July 11th, which uh, was just a month post D-Day. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Dale, I have a few minutes time to myself now, so I thought I would write you a few lines. I'm somewhere in France. And um, it looks somewhat like England. The Germans have made the French let their hedges and trees grow. So it looks kind of wild. Jerry is really dug in deep and it's awfully hard to kick him out. I received my first record in France yesterday. It was the issue of May 12th, but it's most certainly welcome. So even from the front lines, they would write home. Um, in May, 1945, right before the end, right at the end of the war, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Dale, I thought this would be an excellent time to drop you folks a few lines and let you know that I am in the very best of health and very happy that the war in the European theater is almost over. 
I haven't received any of your records for months, but uh, may I say that isn't all your fault for we have been traveling with the fourth armored and the mail just couldn't catch up with us. We are very much pleased to know that once again, and perhaps for all the Germans are thoroughly whipped. People back home do not and probably will never realize what a terrible whipping the Germans and especially their property took in this war. Most of Germany looks like the area north of St. Joe did a few years ago after it was hit by a tornado. And then remember Adolf Wilms who couldn't say what rock he was on? Uh, the rock he was on was Guadalcanal. And here he is in the Philippines a year later. He's still not home. It's still three years. He's still in the Pacific. Um, but the rock he was on at that point was Guadalcanal and now he's in the Philippines. It wasn't all good news in the paper. Um, the nephew of Mr. and Mrs. Ezra Reese died in the Battle of Leyte Gulf in the Philippines in October 1944, but they didn't find out about it till January 16th, 1945. Remember, you had to depend on the telegrams from the military. Uh, there was no phone service, there was no email, there were no texts. Uh, PFC Alvin Bloom was reported missing in France. Uh, I do know he ended up in a POW camp, but I also know he got home okay because I went to school with Kelly Bloom's kids. So I know he got home. Now the most, uh, the, the most complete story I got was about a guy named Fred Lambden. Now Fred Lambden was a little older than everyone else. He was 31 when the war started and uh, he enlisted right away and was part of the um, tank divisions under Patton in, um, in France. Uh, I didn't know Mr. Lambden very well, but I knew his wife exceptionally well because she was my Latin teacher from 1966 to 1968. And she also taught um, world history and directed all the plays at St. Joe Ogden High School. So I knew Mrs. Lambden very, very well, um, but I didn't know her husband. And apparently on December 22nd, 1944, during the Battle of the Bulge, he was caught behind enemy lines and was miss missing in action. And they didn't hear anything about him until um, January. It was lost in December 22nd. In January, all the War Department said was that he was missing in action. So she had no idea where he was. March 30th, 1945, she hears from the War Department again, and they say, oh, by the way, he was in a prisoner of war camp on the Polish border, and he was just liberated by the advancing Russian army. So if you think about it, the Russians were coming from Russia towards Berlin. The POW camp he was in was on the Polish border, so he was liberated by the Russians. And that he would be home sometime. They didn't say when, they just said sometime he'll be home. So a week later, Mrs. Lambden gets a card from her husband that had been written in ja on January 11th saying, I'm in a POW camp, but I'm okay. But she already knew he'd been liberated by the time she got the letter. He got home on April 27th and the entire town of St. Joe, St. Joe turned out for a party at the high school gym and it was packed. And he spent the time talking about um, serving under Patton about doing reconnaissance for his um, armored tank division, getting caught behind enemy lines, being taken prisoner, physically marched across Germany. Um, they didn't take him in trains, they marched him across Germany and that the um, um, English and uh, American soldiers were treated quite well in the POW camp, but the Russians were treated abysmally. So he, he told a complete story by the time he got home and it is printed in the paper. Things started winding down about then. Billy Cole, who enlisted in before the war in 1941 is now a chief petty officer. He's no longer on the Saratoga. He's now working with a, a group that is um, taking down the air bases that were built by the CBs in the Pacific. So he was dismantling air bases. Robert Weaver, who I knew very, very well, he was the postmaster in St. Joe when I was growing up, I left home in 1942, uh, May of 1942, to be deployed overseas. He also went to North Africa. He was a ground traffic controller for the Air Corps. He made sure that the planes were able to fly. They had enough fuel, they had enough bombs, they had enough supplies. 
He said sometimes they were held together really with bailing wire and spit, um, but he got him up in the air. He spent two years in North Africa, then he too was sent to um, India and eventually got home on May 25th, 1945. Now the article about where he went is interesting, but the bottom half of the entire article is who came to the party at his mother's house, all of his relatives and where they live and who came to see him when he got home. Well, my dad got home on June 22nd, 1945, because his destroyer had been disabled and uh, they limped back to Bremerton Naval Base and he came home. And so here's the article about dad being home on leave, 60 days on um, um, leave. And by the time he got back to Bremerton in August, 1945, the war was over. So they turned him around and sent him back home. Um, but again, at, honored at the dinner, it tells who showed up to the party. Uh, one of the few articles that are actually about the war itself and not something from one of the servicemen was on August 17th, 1945. The type is different. It was bracketed and different. It was separate from the rest of the paper by brackets and it was that Japan had surrendered. But not everybody got home right away. Herschel Ring, for example, didn't get home from Japan until September, 1946. Took him a long time to get home. Now, interesting, starting in 1946, we have wedding, 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 and then baby, 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 which are the people I went to high school with. And one of the weddings was Bob Waters married Toots. Um, and now I, I bring up the picture because when you did the World War II exhibit a couple of years ago, there was a couple featured at the very end of the exhibit with her white kimono in the display case, Russell and Helen Landreth, uh, who, um, uh, were surviving after the war, getting Russell through school. Well, I grew up knowing them as Uncle Rut and Aunt Helen because they were my parents' best friends. So there's Uncle Rut as best man and Helen as the matron of honor in um, my parents' wedding. So that's the kind of things you can find out through small town newspapers. It's just a taste of the available information. Um, it's not an easy job to scroll through the microfilm. Uh, it would be so much more comfortable to sit in your own house on your own computer and look things up in a uh, digital database. So I want to encourage people to pay attention to the Champaign County Newspaper Digitization Initiative. It does cost money. It costs between 65 cents and a dollar per page to do the um, digitization. And we've divided it, as I said, into two batches. Batch number one is about 22,000 pages and it covers 1940 to 1980. And we decided to do this as batch number one for a very selfish reason, because that's where the baby boomers are. And the baby boomers have some disposable income and maybe they wanna to donate to get their little league scores. Uh, the second batch is from 1894 to 1939. It's another 22,000 pages. And we estimate it's going to cost about $16,000. And what we're looking for is modest amount from community donors. Um, my friend Jean and I did some calculation. And for the first $16,000, we need 300 people to give $50. We need 600 people to give $25. So we're looking for people to invest in their own community. There's also potential for some grants. Um, Connor's helping us look at grants uh, that hopefully we can start applying for right after Christmas. To date, we started raising money on November 7th, exactly a month ago, November 7th, 30 days ago, we have currently raised $3,000. So we are doing okay. If you want to donate, um, you can get a special pledge envelope from here at the History Museum. We can also donate directly on the Champaign County History Museum website. There's a place you can donate directly or on the history, uh, the Facebook page for the History Museum. And we've also put it, uh, St. Joseph, Illinois has a History of St. Joseph Facebook page, and we've put it there um, for people to donate. Uh, this is a very fun project. Um, we, uh, I've had a lot of fun looking this stuff up for tonight's presentation, and I hope that uh, other people will be as enthusiastic as I am and um, contribute to this great endeavor. So thank you.